So perhaps you've noticed during this Lenten season, we've been looking at the gospel writer John's story of Jesus. And John's telling of the story is a little bit different from the other gospel writers. He gives us a perplexing story, and then he follows it with an even more puzzling one. Nicodemus is told that he must be born from above. The woman at the well is offered living water. A blind man is given sight, but people are upset because it's not done according to the rules. And always John is trying to help us see these signs and wonders, these miracles that point to Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, as the anointed one sent from God to heal and to save. Today's story continues in that same vein and is even more puzzling in many ways than any of the previous ones. It is this story that John uses as the turning point in his telling of the Jesus story. This raising of Lazarus is the crisis that sets in motion the events leading to Jesus' death and God's surprising Easter gift. In the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you see Jesus' final. You see Jesus. You see Jesus' final straw with the temple leader is his overturning of the tables of the money changers in the temple. But for John, that actually happens much earlier in the telling of the story. Instead, in John, it is this story of one brought back from the dead. This is the thing that causes the authorities to decide that this Jesus fellow has to be stopped. And the best way to stop him, of course, is to have him killed. No doubt someone who can do amazing things like this is one who will gather quite a following. Someone who can give to another a gift of new life is one who will gain people's ear, who will be heard and believed, whose criticism of the status quo will be heeded and thought about. No, This Jesus guy can't be allowed to keep doing these wild deeds and saying these crazy things. He must be stopped. He just can't be allowed to cause the lame to leap, the deaf to hear, and the dead to live again. As John tells it, this is the event that creates the explosive atmosphere that will greet Jesus when he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey next week. His triumphal entry will bring him right into the middle of a powder keg, a plot to see him undone and his ministry brought to an end. So how does this event take place? Well, over the years, Jesus had grown close to this family, Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary. Scripture tells us that he loves them and it's just not it's not just a general love. This is filio or friend love. He loves them as friends. It's apparent that these three have spent a lot of time with Jesus. They know him and trust him. They've witnessed the power of God working in him and through him. And so when Lazarus is stricken gravely ill, the sister sends for their friend, Jesus. They want him to make Lazarus well, and I would surmise they also want the comfort of Jesus' strength and presence with them. They know who Jesus is. They believe, they have faith, and they want him to come and keep their lives from falling apart. (coughs) Excuse me. There are so many things in this passage that we'll preach. John's Jesus announces clearly in no uncertain terms that he is the resurrection and the life. Not that he will be, but he is. And there's certainly a sermon in that statement. Then too, John seems to use this incident as a foreshadowing of what is soon to happen to Jesus. Like Lazarus, he too will die, but God will also raise him from the dead. But in a different way. Lazarus was brought back to this life. Jesus is resurrected into eternal life, a life with God from which one never dies. And that will certainly preach. But the sermon I kept hearing, the thing that my mind kept coming back to was Jesus' command to those who are standing by who witnessed this miracle of resurrection. He says to them, unbind him and let him go. 
Now, it's interesting to me that Jesus has done the seemingly impossible, right? He claimed God's power, and with the word, Lazarus, come out. He who had been dead for four days is suddenly alive again. And yet, Jesus then commands the others to do the easier task, unbind him and let him go. Why didn't Jesus just cause the grave clothes to fall off of Lazarus? Why didn't he himself pull the cloth from Lazarus' face and look into the alive again eyes of this friend for whom he just wept? Why does he have the others do it? And why is John so careful to include a detail like this in the story? Unbind him and let him go. Was that just a word for those mourners who had come to weep over Lazarus' grave all those years ago? Or is it, in fact, a continuing command to all of us who claim to believe and follow Jesus the Christ? I believe John wanted those words heard by the Christian community of his time and by us who were to follow. It seems to me that we must always keep in mind that we are co-creators with Christ, people who are to assist in the shaping and molding of this new creation, this kingdom of God. God with Jesus and the Holy Spirit will do their parts, but we must do our part as well. Unbind him and let him go. But Lord, he stinks. Yeah, sometimes old life, death can get pretty dirty, kind of nasty. I want to make him clean again. So go get those rags off of him. Help him shed the remnants of his old life. But Lord, I, I, I really don't think. Maybe not, but I do. You think you know, but you don't. He needs a little help finding his way out of that grave he's enveloped in. Give him a hand. Point her in the right direction. But I want to know why you let this happen, Lord. Why weren't you here? Where were you when we needed you? He never would have ended up in this condition if you just answered my prayers like I'd ask. I am who I am. I am life. This was not my will for her life. I never intended her to come to this place, but I brought her out from there. Now you show her the way. Uncover her eyes. Point her toward new life, toward Jesus. How willing are we to get our hands dirty? Do we let the one who has found new life, life through Jesus, stand and mobilize because we can't believe it? We don't trust that it's real? Will we take the time to help unwind that shroud of death, even if it takes a while? Even if it's uncomfortable? Difficult? Or do we think we know who deserves new life? Do we keep them bound by our rules, our notions of who Jesus loves and who he doesn't? Will we be there to prop the other up, to allow him to lean on us when that one who has been dead for so long finds that her muscles have atrophied, that his memory fails him as to how to walk the path of righteousness? Will we have patience and grace and kindness to help this one start over again, to pick him up when he falls, to catch her when she stumbles, to drag him up when he begins to slide backwards? Or will we decide we're better than that? They can just suffer the consequences, you know. They got themselves all knotted up. They can just get themselves out of that mess. Unbind him and let him go. Don't just let him go on his own. Go with him. Show him the way. Walk beside him. Join him on the journey. You know, we're getting nearer to Easter, but to get there requires walking through the graveyard. There we see Lazarus given new life, but there's another graveyard we pass through as well. On the other side of the cross, there's an empty tomb. There we see that God has unbound us from slavery to sin and death. And there we will meet the resurrected Jesus, the one who is all too ready to give new life. The question for us is will we keep him under wraps or will we loose him in the world? Unbind him and let him go. Thanks be to God. Amen.